Good afternoon and welcome to the second episode of Pipelines 101. I'm Shelley Robbins, Energy and State Policy Director of Upstate Forever. We are an environmental advocacy nonprofit that serves the 10 county upstate region of South Carolina. We work to balance growth and natural resource protection. But with me today is David Sly, Conservation Director for Wild Virginia. Wild Virginia is a nonprofit based out of Charlottesville that works to preserve and support the complexity, diversity, and stability of natural ecosystems by enhancing connectivity, water quality, and climate in the forests, mountains, and waters of Virginia through education and advocacy. If you tuned into episode one, you're going to get a little bit of a repeat here, but we also have some new registrants. So why are we here? Why are we offering this webinar series? Well, in 2016, Dominion Resources proposed a 55-mile natural gas pipeline that would impact four upstate South Carolina counties and more than 70 stream and river crossings, including some areas that Upstate Forever had identified as conservation focus areas. We intervened in the certificate proceeding and were represented by the South Carolina Environmental Law Project and specifically by Michael Corley, who presented an overview of the FERC process in episode one. We also benefited from the talents of David Sly with me today and our own GIS manager, Katie Hoddle. And David will be back with Katie to share additional expertise in episode four next week. Well, ultimately, that pipeline was granted a certificate of public convenience and necessity by FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. It was built and is now in service, but it has caused significant problems, um, spe specifically impacting a water utility, but a big mess. We recognize that given the current market and regulatory structure, there will be many additional natural gas pipelines proposed in the Southeast, and we want to share what we learned. We started our intervention process with no background in interstate natural gas pipeline regulation, and the learning curve was really steep. We learned as we went along, and once the process was finished, we realized that other communities could benefit from a crash course on this issue. We also plan to record each webinar and make the recordings as well as the PDF slide deck available on our website. We'll send it out to you and we will try to make it easily searchable on the internet as well. This series was made possible by funding from a private donor and we are eternally grateful. Now, episode one was an overview of the relevant statutes, such as the Natural Gas Act, NEPA, and others, and the FERC certificate process, as well as a lesson in navigating the FERC website. Now, in episode two, Today, David Sly, who consulted with us on our pipeline intervention and who is heavily involved in pipeline issues in Virginia and also a former Virginia DEQ water quality expert, will go into detail on the one piece of the process that does give states some authority, and that is the 401 certification of the Army Corps of Engineers Nationwide 12 Permit for Water Impacts. David will explain what is involved in the 401 certification and where the insertion points are, and then he'll share some of the latest developments in this arena. And truly, that is changing almost daily with new court rulings involving both the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and the Mountain Valley Pipeline. In the third episode next Monday, I will explain pipeline construction. I'll also explain decatherms and how you can use them to fully understand how big a pipeline is beyond just its diameter, what size demand it was meant to serve, whether that demand is realistic or perhaps artificially manipulated in order to justify the pipeline to FERC. And I'll also talk about natural gas exports and prices. Exports are increasingly driving pipeline construction and experts believe that exports will drive domestic gas prices up in the long run. And then in the final episode on October 31, we'll talk about the impact pipelines have on conservation easements and on timber properties, and those can be significant. And I'll share some right-of-way contract best practices that our upstate timber owners were able to negotiate. We'll share the GIS process that we used in order to identify all the property owners along our 55-mile pipeline. And we use that information to communicate with them regarding their rights, as well as to make it sure they were aware of some meetings and input opportunities. And then David Sly will be back and he'll share some of the various monitoring tools and programs that other communities can learn from and use. 
And let's, so let's get started. We're going to leave time at the end to answer questions, which you can enter at any time using the question box over on the right hand side in that drop down menu. Um, you can ask questions of either David or me. And with that, I'll give you David Sly. All right. Thank you very much, Shelley. Um, I want to ask folks who are listening to uh, uh, understand that I'm developing a cold. And so if I'm making uh, unpleasant noises, I'm sorry about that. I'll try to limit it as much as I can. Um, Shelly told you that I worked for the uh, Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. Actually, I was a technical person, a science, science guy working on water quality for the first 15 years of my career. Um, and then realized I needed some more tools to try to make things happen the way I wanted them and then went to law school. So ever since then, I've worked for nonprofit groups, uh, mostly trying to make my old colleagues and other agencies do their jobs. Um, and Section 401 of the Clean Water Act, as Shelley said, is a very strong tool. It is important for pipeline cases, but also for lots of other cases. And that's kind of how other, other realms where I've worked on it or where I really developed a lot of background. Specifically, I worked on hydropower uh, relicensing cases all over the Southeast US. And that's where I, I really came to know uh, FERC uh, more intimately than I ever wanted. Uh, again, as Shelley said, there's some overlap between what you heard if you were on episode, if you listened to episode one and this one. I do intend to focus heavily on 401, but you kind of have to see it within the context of the other regulatory processes that are going on. And so that's why, you know, I start with this first slide saying that this is a regulatory maze. This is, this is a real set of confusing and uh, interlocking and contradictory requirements uh, from federal and state laws and regulations. And I guess the big thing I want to say about that is that it seems really daunting and sometimes it is. But what you should remember is that that gives you a bunch of tools. Uh, it gives you a, a, a real set of different ways to approach these cases to try to enforce the things that you care about. So, and, and there's lots of help out there to help you figure out how to negotiate these things. So don't, don't let that complexity push you back, uh, use it to encourage you that you've, you've got something to work with. Um, and again, I, whether you have worked in regulatory processes, legal cases, or anything else, um, you can be involved. Uh, one of the great things that we're proud of from Wild Virginia is basically instructing people how to bring their values and their concerns and their local knowledge into these regulatory processes and try to make it count. So uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, again, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, is one of the one of the bedrock federal environmental laws that requires federal agencies any federal agency that is going to take an action that can have a, a significant impact on the environment to do an analysis um, in these cases the FERC takes the lead in that NEPA process and other agencies both federal and state uh, can be what they call cooperating agencies. Now, they can that that can include people with um, with respond or agencies with responsibility like Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Park Service. If there are other federal lands involved, if there are endangered, threatened species involved, all of those agencies have to be involved, and they may or may not um agree with all of the uh, focus of that FERC puts into the NEPA and they have 
both separate responsibilities and authorities to try to make that go the way they're supposed to. In fact, those other agencies can adopt NEPA's or uh, FERC's environmental process, but they don't have to. And we have at times tried to push, for example, the Forest Service, who at one time had exercised some real um, initiative and in looking out for their own their own lands, to not adopt FERC's um, environmental impact statement. Um, anyway, that's a detail that um, probably too deep to get into here. Um, next slide, please. The thing about NEPA is it's not going to be the savior when you're talking about um, describing bad things and stopping them under NEPA, because by design, NEPA is to give you uh, the chance to see what's going on and the decision makers and to try to, to weigh in on it and bring evidence to the system. Uh, the unfortunate thing is it really doesn't have uh, a lot of substantive weight. So FERC or other agencies can say, hey, we looked at the picture here. We looked at everything very completely. And yes, there are going to be some bad impacts. But they, under NEPA, they can still approve of those things. Now, there are other laws and other rules that, that apply. Uh, but you have to understand that because you're not going to be able through NEPA to uh, to say NEPA requires you to protect this, this, or this. Next slide. Uh, again, complexity. Um, how NEPA works is governed by the, the statute itself, the federal law, but also by regulations that are adopted by the uh, Council on Environmental Quality and by other agencies, including FERC and any other agency that's involved. Now, as I said, that pre um, procedural aspect is best kind of quickly described by the courts as saying agencies have to take a hard look at what's going to happen, what the impacts might be, how those impacts might or might not be able to be mitigated by the uh, by the companies, the, the project uh, proponents, and the agencies. Uh, next, to to come up with that full picture, the agencies can do one of one of two things. They can do an environmental impact statement or an environmental assessment. Um, that depends really on the level of of impact that there might be and and basically the the determination of whether there's going to be a significant impact or not uh next slide um for these major interstate national ga natural gas pipelines it's frankly uh inconceivable to me that they could make a determination that there won't be significant impacts and I, while there might be pipelines governed by FERC where they've only done an EA, I don't know of them. Uh, but that should be the first thing is you should be pretty much demanding from the very beginning that this is a major thing that's going to have significant impacts just by design. Just that by. Was, that was ours, Dave. They only did an EA. Okay. Okay. We, we requested an EIS and they disagreed. They said no. Well, thanks for uh, reminding me of that. I probably knew that at some point, but I had forgotten it. And again, that that seems uh, pretty absurd. That may be, you know, in another case, that may be something that is challengeable in court because a determination that that a huge project does not have significant impacts is. Uh, seems seems to be uh, vulnerable in most cases and, yeah. in, and in hindsight in hindsight they were significant impacts yeah, yeah. well you know that's a point that that kind of uh, you prompt me 
in saying that, you know, we're building not only knowledge amongst the conservation community of how to, how to address these cases, but we're also building a database, if you will, of the huge impacts that are happening out there on the ground. I mean, in Virginia here, in West Virginia, in Pennsylvania, New York, well, not so much in New York, and I'll tell you why, uh, but wherever these huge pipelines are being built, they're causing great damage. And we are, you know, we're referencing that as we go into court, as we take on the next challenge, uh, because it just can't be ignored. We get a lot of assurances from agencies that we can handle it all. Everything can be prevented or mitigated. And it turns out just not to be true. So just a couple things about the, the NEPA project or the, uh, the FERC process and how they do their NEPA responsibilities. Just a couple of things that have been important to us in the cases that I've worked on, but also in some of, some of the court cases against FERC, is the fact that under NEPA, you're supposed to look at the need for the project, whether it should be, whether it should happen at all because this is supposed to be a balance between the benefits, the need for something, and the damages that will occur. Uh, there's a basic flaw in the way FERC approaches that in that they have not really looked at need either sufficiently on an individual case for these pipelines and certainly not on the larger picture. As Shelley said, I mean, First of all, there have been dozens of these things proposed just from the fracking fields of West Virginia and Pennsylvania towards the coast in all different directions. And we have fought hard to say, you got to look at this whole picture because really FERC is the only, only body that could do that. Um, you got to look at how it's going to affect the whole thing. But so far they have refused to do that and again that's just another thing to have in mind and should be one of the focuses of comments you make whether it's something that in the end you're going to be able to win uh, to take into court whatever else you need to lay the foundation and be looking at that the other thing is the range of alternatives that they offer or that that FERC looks at in relation to meeting whatever needs they claim exist. And there again, FERC has not been, uh, has not done a good job in any case where I've been involved of looking at the reasonable alternatives. And so those are just some major, major issues I thought I'd point out. Next, please. And again, you know, when, if they're going to do this overall view of the potential impacts of a project, the, the, uh, the law says they have to use the best available science. They had to address kind of all the major, major potential areas of impact. Uh, we've seen that sometimes they've, they've worked hard to try to ignore some things like climate impacts. Uh, there are many, many impacts from these things. And one of the things that you can insist on um, is not so much that my science as a conservation group or as an advocate is better than the agencies because courts usually are gonna give them a lot of leeway. That's what uh, you know this judicial deference kind of means is that if you got an agency that's supposed to have expertise, it's going to be hard for me to overcome that. Even if I have better science, it's going to be hard to convince them. But if they leave out big chunks, if they leave out some of the major topics, if they ignore up-to-date science, then those are strong tools. Next. Okay. So I'm now going to move into Clean Water Act 404. This authority is given to the Corps of Engineers generally. Now, there are some cases where states take on responsibilities under Section 404, and I, I'm not aware 
that South Carolina is one of those. Um, there, I don't think there are that many of them. I have never dealt with one, but in any case, these are permits that are specifically focused on discharges of what they call dredge and fill materials. Basically, wherever you're digging through streams or wetlands or working directly in the riparian areas such that you may cause discharges of sediments or other materials directly to those water bodies, then that's where 404 governs. Now, we all know that when they work, you know, up in the watershed and other areas that they're going to release sediments also and possibly other pollutants. Uh, but that does not come under the Corps purview under Section 404. So you got to realize that they're only looking at one piece of the whole picture of the pipeline. Next, please. Um, now, when the Corps gets an application from a pipeline company or anybody else, they they have a structure under which they can do an individual permit and that involves things like public notice, public hearings, the chance for the for for comments to be gathered. And it also requires them to basically lay out uh, a bit of detailed analysis and data gathering of their own as to what's happening out there on the ground. What are these water bodies looking like? And, you know, what will the crossing methods be and all those kinds of things. Um, the other option is for them to cover projects under what are called nationwide permits. This is a general blanket permit that's given for a whole category of projects or, or activities as it, as it implies on a nationwide scale. Now, the fact is that they are almost never adequate because obviously you cannot account for all the site specific, uh, you know, changes and differences in environments that you're going to encounter. So, you know, general assurances that a certain method of construction or a certain method of pollution control is going to be okay in both South Carolina and Wyoming and New Hampshire makes no sense. Uh, and yet it is the Corps' preference to, to cover projects, even huge projects like these pipelines, under this nationwide 12 permit. Um, so that's one of the first things you're going you're gonna to be thinking about once a project starts or a process starts. <laughs> is you know what are the angles what how do i explain why this should not go under this nationwide permit next please uh, again nationwide 12 applies to what are termed utility lines it's gas pipelines um, oil other kinds of utilities that have nothing to do with uh, with what we're looking at and that's another point as to why there's such it, it's such over generalization in looking at these things because they're just not all the same. Um, conceptually or, or supposedly, the nationwide 12 permits are only appropriate if there would be minimal individual or cumulative impacts from the projects that would be covered. And there again, that that's just not even that's not a conceivable or, or a, a believable argument in relation to these things but I, again I think Shelley can tell you that that's what what's been done in the cases or the case she dealt with and it's been done in a lot of other cases also um, we are fighting about those very decisions right here, especially in West Virginia, but also in Virginia, and have, as I'll say a little later, explain a little later, have gotten the court to agree with us in one case that that nationwide permit is just not appropriate for, for a huge part of a pipeline at least. Next. Okay. Um, 
there are, unlike NEPA, there are important substantive environmental protection requirements that are supposed to be implemented under Section 404. Now, again, if you're working, if, if the Corps chooses to cover a project under this nationwide scale, then essentially they're saying, you don't need to look under the hood. Everything's been taken care of. We, we thought of all these things and they're all fine. And that's why if you could, if you can get an individual process, that you can dig more into these substantive requirements, which frankly, uh, since they were developed by EPA rather than the core, which is kind of a unique situation that EPA came up with these very protective regulations and then the law says the core has to acknowledge them and implement them. That's a pretty, that's a pretty strong thing. Now, everybody can understand that under our current uh, federal administration recourse to EPA to try to tell the core what it should do may not be as great an, op or, um, an option as it has been at some times. There are cases where EPA has essentially vetoed the Corps' approval of activities under Section 404. But anyway, those, those guidelines that are established in regulation are very strong. And you want to understand what, what they say. Next. So finally, I'm getting to Section 404, or 401 rather. This, um, one of the things you need to understand, uh, you see the word veto there in that first sentence. Congress was very explicit. The members of Congress who, who pushed the Clean Water Act in 1972 were very explicit that this authority um, was being reserved to the states to stop federally licensed projects if they couldn't make sure that their waters would be fully protected. Now, if you learn nothing else from this talk, remember that word veto and realize that your state agencies, your federal agencies, FERC, the companies, um, if they even understand that that is their responsibility, um, will we'll usually not tell you that. Uh, our politicians here in Virginia have maintained over and over for the last four years that the state of Virginia has no power to stop these pipelines, even if it wanted to. And uh, unfortunately, that was just a lie. And over the course of those four years, we've been able to convince the, the public that they're being lied to. And we've made an impact on the regulatory bodies to finally admit that that's the case. Now, um, that section 401 kicks in on a lot of projects. And the reason that it, that it is applicable for pipelines and other things is that this, again, it's a federally um, regulated project that quote, may result in a discharge to state waters. And so once you meet that threshold, once a project is determined to be in that category, then section 401 kicks in. Next, please. Um, so how will the state exercise that authority that's been reserved for them and that's spelled out in the Clean Water Act? They can issue a, what's called a water quality certification. Um, that certification can, can basically include any conditions that the state can justify under their own state rules uh, or basically just under what is needed to protect their waters. They have extremely broad response or broad purview as to what they can talk about in the certification and what they can require. Uh, there again, a lot of folks, uh, some states that I've worked with, and I've not just worked with Virginia, West Virginia, South Carolina, I've worked with 
four or five others. And in many cases, one of the first things is to talk to those regulators, even the ones down on the front lines and say, you know, you realize you have very broad authority as to what you look at here. And most of them do not know that. You know, that's one of the things I think that, that Shelly wanted to try to get across to her agency folks is you do have a lot of authority and we understand what your authority is. And uh, so that's an important thing. Um, of course, instead of issuing the certification, the state can veto or can, can deny the application. Um, a lot of times when they deny the application, it's because they've asked for a really detailed and adequate information that the companies aren't giving them. Um, because frankly, with such impactful projects as these pipelines, to really paint the full picture of what will happen to these water bodies, it's not going to be a pleasant view. And so the companies try to, to give you broad brush uh, assurances and descriptions of what they will do and how it will impact your waters. Um, and so if states are doing those job, their job correctly, they continue and insist on the kind of detail that's necessary under their water quality standards. Um, again, if they deny that application, then the project cannot go forward. Construction cannot happen. And I can't emphasize that enough because even folks that I've dealt with on my side of the fence, it took me a long time to convince them that that was the rule. Uh, again, we have some court cases that back that up fairly recently. The other thing that a state can do is it can waive its authority to act under Section 401. And that's a very unfortunate part of the, of the process is that some states basically just are timid and won't live up to their responsibility and either say yes or no. Just by, by default, the thing can go forward because they won't live up to their responsibility. Um, sometimes they have uh, tried to live at their, their responsibility, but they haven't done it quickly enough. They're under FERC projects, they have a year from the time um, of application. Now there's, there's complications as to when that year exactly starts. But if they don't act within that year, then it's deemed to have been waived and the federal agency can go forward. Um, so it's important to know when that application become, is, is filed and to continue to put pressure on the agency, the state agency, to keep track of that deadline. And if there's a question, it's always safer for them to deny the application and say, as I said before, you don't have enough information. We can't make a decision because you haven't you haven't given us all the data. And so we're denying it. But of course, you can come back later if you bring all the information you should have. Next, David, um, it, am I recalling correctly, though, that when the agency requests data from the pipeline company, the clock stops? Well, it, like I say, that it gets really complicated legally because of some rulings that FERC has made and because of some court rulings. And it's probably just, it would bend your mind too much for me to try to get into all those wrinkles. The safest thing is to know the day that application comes in and continue to push your agency to act as soon as possible and just assume that that is the the start date of the year. Yeah, I do because, remember we were we were watching that clock. I remember that. Yeah. I mean it, it clearly it makes sense to say if you didn't have a complete application then the clock stops. And that has been a traditional way of looking at it, but again, FERC has made some decisions in the last 2 years that that question that. And at least one federal appeals court sided with FERC. 
And so that's a real dangerous thing to, to take that for granted. Um, the other thing you need to understand, especially with regard to these uh, pipelines, again, the state's 401 authority applies to every one of the federal permitting actions uh, for which the activities may result in discharges to their waters. So a state, and again, this has happened many times, a state can focus its water quality certification review on just that piece of the project that the core regulates under section 404. Well, if they do that, then they're ignoring all the other uh, activities that aren't specifically in stream or in, in the water body or near it. They're ignoring all those upland activities, or they could be, if they, if they maintain that narrow focus. Now, FERC's responsibility and its authority over a pipeline project covers everything, every inch of the project, and basically every activity that could be involved with it. And so we had, again, here in Virginia, we had to fight over this. Their original intent was to depend on the Section 404 permit from the Corps, um, certify that, and say, we're done. We don't have to look at any of those upland activities, uh, road building that doesn't, doesn't go through a stream. We don't have to do that. And we rode them hard enough that they actually developed a separate project to look at all the so-called upland impacts. Um, it's an unwieldy and frankly ridiculous system that they, they developed, but at least we forced them to look at all the activities that FERC regulates. And that was, that was uh, in some sense a win. Um, I'll tell you, I worked on a case in Maryland several years ago. Maryland actually did a pretty decent job uh, with, with lots of prodding from us at looking at some of the individual impacts. And in fact, the general, the nationwide permit from the Corps was not applied to that pipeline. So it went through individual reviews for all the crossings. But there again, Maryland ignored all of those upland impacts that were also being authorized under the FERC certificate. Uh, next, please. Okay, again, that, that threshold that there, there may be a discharge is where you start, but uh, this goes all the way up to the Supreme Court and, and the courts have said that once you know there's gonna be a discharge or there may be a discharge, then your 401 certification review can look at essentially any aspect of that whole project. Um, I'll give you an example. On, on hydropower cases, for example, uh, the discharge in one of those cases is basically what comes through the dam into the river below. And a lot of times in the past, people said that's the only thing the state can look at is how that water flows from above the dam to below the dam because that's the discharge. And again, that went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, no, that's not the case. When you look at the wording of the statute, what it says is that's the trigger. But then once that trigger is, is activated, you can look at everything. And so hydropower cases have looked at everything from the connectivity of the watersheds. They've looked at invasive species they've looked at all kinds of stuff and so the the same kind of really broad view of their authority is appropriate for the state um next please now again the reason that we kind of had to roll the core thing and the nepa thing together with 401 is that when you look at the Corps' nationwide 12 permit for pipelines, uh, the state can also issue its own general certification. Uh, 
those nationwide permits come up every five years. Some others are different time frames, but these are for every five years. When that happens, your state can issue, as long as its state laws allow it, can issue what's called a general certification. And to be blunt, that general certification is usually just as worthless as the nationwide 12 permit because it does not include the kind of detailed look at, at all the different environments that might be applied or where it might be applied. So, but those general certifications from the state can also have important conditions to say, okay, this will apply to some of the things that are covered under nationwide 12, but some of them just won't be covered just because they can't, we can't assure that, that that coverage is good enough. For example, the state of West Virginia said you can't cover any pipeline larger than 36 inches under the nationwide 12, and it can't be covered under the general certification. Um, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and the Mount Valley Pipeline, both of which I've worked on, um, couldn't be covered under West Virginia's general certification because they're both 42 inch pipelines in that area. So one thing apart from any specific pipeline project is you should find out um, what your general certifications look like if your state has issued a general certification for nationwide 12 you should know what it says and frankly uh, prospectively you should be thinking about uh, can you strengthen that down the road now again you've got you got about three years before you're going to have another one of those chances because the most recent one was issued in january 17 2017 but that's something to think about for the future uh, if you could get the right kind of conditions or or get the state to say we're not going to issue a general certification for nationwide 12, then that could be very important for you. Next. So again, why do I harp on general versus individual? One of the strongest reasons is that you can get heavily involved if there's an individual process. There has to be public participation. Again, exactly what that public participation looks like would be, will be governed mostly by your state law, but it has to be at a minimum a chance to uh, to have the uh, you know the public notice and comment may or may not include hearings and other other parts of the process. But that's one of the greatest things that we've been able to depend on to bring in the kind of science and the kind of analysis of what's going to happen on these pipelines and how that relates to our water quality standards. And uh, that's the key here. Is what do your water quality standards say? And what is the reality as to whether they can be met by this pipeline construction? Now, I have argued from the very first day of proposal of these pipelines that you can tell me all you want about the need and the routes and everything else but as a former senior engineer with DEQ and as somebody who's looked at streams all my life you can't do what you want to do here and meet our water quality standards I think I heard maybe Shelly were hmm? you going to break in um, well okay. what I was going to say is on the uh when when we were pushing DHEC on that 401 certification, one thing we did get them to do is hold a public meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and we were able to broaden the only um, the only uh, stakeholder names they had were those with specific types of water crossings on their property. So we used our our uh, list of property owners that we developed using our uh, GIS tool, which we'll talk about in episode four, to contact all the property owners and also to give those addresses to DHEC to 
encourage them to provide feedback to DHAC and to go to this public meeting and to say how, you know, this is what my property is and this is how it's going to be negatively affected. And, you know, basically to give more on the ground detail about um, how that, that construction was going to individually affect um, those property owners. And that was a little unusual, but we were able, you know, to, to do that. Yeah. And, you know, again, just if, if you look at your own water quality standards in any other context, whether it be a, uh, an MPDS uh, discharge from a wastewater plant or an industry, if you look at it in relation to your, your stormwater uh, or construction stormwater controls, uh, the kind of requirements that are enforced in those operations or those regulatory processes in general are way more stringent than these pipelines could meet. For example, uh, Virginia's, um, Virginia's water quality standards simply say you can't have discharges that cause turbidity in the stream. Um, you can't have discharges that impair the habitats and, and the viability of, of species. Well, we're looking at impacts here where whole habitats are destroyed. We're looking at impacts here where nobody can claim that there won't be turbidity caused from the in-stream and the upland activities. So forcing that direct, the, the standards and what will happen here to be laid side by side for everybody to see is the key here. And as you say, when you can get, I, I tend to focus, you know, very heavily on the legal aspects of it because of my background, but all this feeds into your, your whole public campaign or your whole effort. And when you can get the public uh, standing up for their own waters. And again, this is not just the piece of water where the pipeline directly crosses. It's all those folks downstream who will be affected. The city of Roanoke, Virginia has calculated basically that the Mountain Valley Pipeline, because of the impacts throughout the watershed upstream of its water supply intake, will cost it many, many thousands of dollars per year just to deal with, with the sediments. So it's that kind of larger picture that you can bring in um, if you get into this 401 process, if you can force a public participation um, and you can use it effectively. Next. Okay. Again, the standard under which the state can give certification, a water quality certification, is that there's reasonable assurance that all standards will be met. Um, you know, that's not a guess as to they might. That's not a, you know, it's, it, it's a fairly exacting standard. And they have to, they have to explain why that would work. Now, again, here in Virginia, we've challenged some of the analyses. Uh, we actually have a, a court case still pen or a court decision still pending where we showed the courts that they didn't even really do that kind of analysis in relation to parts of the water quality standards. Uh, in fact, we've had our own DEQ here admit fairly recently that uh, we don't really intend to uh, apply that turbidity part of our standard, the narrative criteria, uh, because we don't know how. Uh, that was a pretty shocking thing. We, we knew they weren't prepared to do it correctly, but they finally admitted that they're just not going to do it. And that was pretty useful to, to go into court with. But anyhow, that reasonable assurance is something you, you, you will learn if you're one of these cases to keep bringing up and to try to define how that works in relation to your standards. Next. Okay, well, the I, I have harked back 
to a number of uh, kind of legal issues, um, court issues. And I can get into some of those, but as Shelley said, I can't even keep up. Wild Virginia has been a plaintiff in seven different lawsuits so far four against the Mountain Valley Pipeline and three against the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Uh, some of those have been resolved, but most have not. Uh, we have actually won some victories, which is always worth, uh, worth trumpeting. We, we got a bad decision on the water quality certification for Mountain Valley Pipeline, but now we have argued essentially a similar case on the Atlantic Coast Pipeline are waiting for an outcome of that. But the good thing that we're able to, we were able to do was to show, as, as Shelley mentioned earlier, that, okay, the state of Virginia gave this reasonable assurance for the Mountain Valley Pipeline, but the results out on the ground had been catastrophic. Now, we also used, uh, Shelly shared with us photos and information about the bad effects that the Minions Pipeline has had down there. And we were able to bring those into the, into the picture also. So in any case, um, we, we believe that that case is strong. But um, what we've won on more recently was not strictly a 401 case, but it was against the Forest Service. Remember earlier I said that uh, the Forest Service can have a role because they've got their own regulatory process for the pipeline, for either of the pipelines here in Virginia and West Virginia to cross the National Forest, they have to get essentially a right-of-way uh, permit from the Forest Service. Well, there for the Mountain Valley Pipeline, we were able to show that the water quality impacts from the, just that portion that would cross the National Forest had not been adequately assessed and were likely to be much worse than what, what the company um, said they would be. This brings up something that is applicable not only to this case, not only to the Forest Service, but to every agency. What we had there is that Forest Service personnel in the, um, the forest in Virginia and West Virginia, the scientists and the technical people and the hydrologists, kind of down below the surface, did an amazing job for the first year or two of this, these proposals of building a record of what the impacts could be, what studies were absolutely required before they should go forward. And so we had that kind of sitting there like a bomb in the files. So when the Forest Service, when the upper level management then came along and said, we're going to approve this thing anyway, um, we had that. And I encourage you, uh, Shelley mentioned DHEC. I've actually worked with DHEC on other kinds of issues in the past. Uh, I've worked with, with people in our water quality agency, in our game commission, in other, play, other um, agencies in Virginia and other states. Get to know those folks. Um, you know, they're, they're not going to be an advocate for your side openly, but sometimes they're very very sympathetic to the concerns you're raising. And sometimes you can help them figure out how to tell the story. Sometimes you can help them understand their own authorities. Uh, again, I've spoken to state water quality folks who said, uh, you know, my authority is really limited. And I was able to, to instruct them on why that was just not the case. So that, that that uh, Forest Service case is an illustration of how important that can be because the judges looked at this record. They said, your scientists said one thing, your decision makers said another, but you didn't explain why that's okay. And they were very harsh on the Forest Service for that. The same thing can happen with your water quality agency. 
Um, we weren't as successful with it on this on MVP, but our water quality people said in memos and things throughout the period, uh, this kind of stand, uh, kind of study is really pretty necessary for us to make a real determination. And then X study never happened. So keep, keep those kinds of things in mind. Now, really momentous as far as the power of water quality certification section 401 um, the the key the the kind of marquee case is one uh, where the state of new york denied certification for the constitution pipeline a big pipeline that would run through parts of pennsylvania and new york and the state of new york said no we will not allow this to be built because you have not proved your case. And um, as I referenced before, one of the main things they said is not that you can't prove your case, but you have not done so. We've asked you for all this kind of information and you haven't given it to us. Now, what they know is that if all that information were provided, it would show that standards wouldn't be met. But you know, it was enough for them to say, you, you haven't filed all the right data. And that has been challenged. It was challenged up to the appeals court and it was challenged. Uh, it was denied. The challenge to the Supreme Court was not taken up. So essentially, New York has won that case. New York has denied some other certifications and the legal picture gets a little messier there specifically because of that waiver issue that we were talking about earlier. The fact that there were applications put into the state of New York, the state of New York said these applications are complete, so the one-year clock has not started. And that caused them problems. And that's why I say you want to be very cautious and you want to push your state agency to be very cautious in that regard too. David, I'm going to refer to one of our questions here and get some clarification. Yeah. It was about, um, um, it, this uh, relates to whether or not Virginia could kill the pipeline by denying the application as New York has done. It says, um, who would do that? Would it be the governor or who would deny it? Okay. It would be the, the water agency, right? The WQC. Yeah, in, in Virginia, what we have is a body called the State Water Control Board. They're a citizen body of seven members, and they are really the regulatory authority. Now, the Department of Environmental Quality essentially is staff to that, to that board. And so the, the technical, the regulatory process uh, programs are run under DEQ, but the board has that authority. And there is absolutely no question that the board could have turned down both of these certifications. And frankly, we, we came pretty close. We had three of the seven members vote to deny uh, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline certification. Um, we've even come back since the horror stories have happened on MVP with just rampant violations, mud flowing everywhere, streams streams damaged uh, to, a, to a horrible extent. And we came back several months ago and asked that same regulatory body to withdraw certification for both of these projects. Uh, there again, we, we came up with three out of seven votes. We, we weren't able to turn it all together. But the 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 authority was there we just didn't have the political will from those folks in that case now i do know that in other cases the actual administrative agency makes the final decision but it depends on on your state system okay and i'm um, going back to the pipelines of a certain size not yeah. being um, allowed to be covered that was specifically a west virginia um, yeah. um, um a characteristic of the nationwide 12 correct well it's the characteristic of the way west virginia issued its general certification for nationwide 12. okay but most yeah. 
that's probably an unusual situation. Well, I, that's why I say you just got to go look at your general certification and see what it says. Uh, there are some states that have not issued a general certification for nationwide 12. So any interstate natural gas pipeline has to go through an individual process. The one case that I worked on in Maryland was much smaller than any of these others that we're talking about. And that went through a nationwide or uh, an individual process by the state and by the Corps because the state just had not granted that general certification. So you just got to you've got to look at your state uh, action and see what it says. I have another uh, good question here. Um, how does it play out with Native American land? OK, well, if, if you know anything about Native um, you know, law, Native tribes are um, sovereign bodies. And so they are supposed to have very important um, abilities here. One thing that if it's a recognized tribe and they have adopted their own water quality standards, which some have, then they have that tool and that power going for them, that their own standards have to be applied. Now, as far as the overall process, they're supposed to, as I understand it, there's supposed to be consultation from FERC with the tribes. There's also supposed to be from the core some kind of of interaction, which my perception is that the Corps has done a pretty horrible job of that. I think you probably heard some discussion of that when it came to the uh, the Dakota, uh, the, the pipeline out in uh, the, the, the Dakotas, uh, Dakota Access. So one, one thing we learned here in South Carolina is they only consult with federally recognized tribes. Well, they yeah. don't. Yeah, they don't. Like we have, we had a state recognized, but not a federal, federally recognized band of Cherokee here uh, in the upstate, and they were never consulted. Well, yeah, I think that that is an overall problem with with any federal uh, process. Now, I would say that from a state standpoint, it could be very useful to get that tribe as involved as possible in the 401 process, because there again. But, you know, the way I express water quality standards is, yes, they're technical and scientific measures, but what they're really supposed to protect is the values and the uses that matter to the people in your state. So always insisting on the fact that that viewpoint be brought forward when they're when you're deciding whether they can be met or not. You know, tribes could be very powerful in that way. I mean, one of the things that's been very powerful for us in Virginia in the discussions and, and may, may be decisive in the court case also is that we have groundwater standards. We don't just have surface water standards, but we have really good groundwater standards. And those can be and should be enforced through the 401 certification also. Part of the reason that's so important here is we have all this karst terrain, limestone and other, other porous rocks throughout the whole Valley of Virginia for hundreds of miles. And wherever you dig through um, or, or do any kind of heavy activity in those areas, you can ruin water, uh, groundwater for miles away. You can change the way that your groundwater flows. And we were able to bring that in and the fact that we've got thousands of people out there in the countryside who depend on that groundwater for their personal wells was a pretty, pretty important part of the, uh, of the story that we were able to tell. All right. I'm going uh, uh, to, I don't, I don't want to interrupt. Go ahead. I just want to extend that point a little bit more. And again, where here Virginia had a responsibility not only to its apply its surface water water quality standards but its groundwater standards 401 
as I just can't say it enough, it gives the state very wide latitude to enforce the rules and the regulations and the statutes that are that relate to water quality in any sense. And so anytime somebody starts to talk about it and is trying to limit the scope of their 401 authority or trying to claim that it's limited, they're just wrong. It is a very wide spread authority. What you have to look out for, though, is political will. Absolutely. <laughs> That's, you know, who's, who's going to, yeah. is the executive branch going to stand behind that agency when they make that decision right and you know again what happened here in Virginia is that our governor at the time Terry McAuliffe came out in favor of both of these huge pipelines before any regulatory system had even or process had even begun and you know that just put a thumb on the scales that was really really hard to overcome we we weren't able to overcome it on through the agency and the water board, uh, but it uh, we might be able to overcome it through the through the courts. And that's right, why, I, I say, you know, I I know that I talk about regulations and laws ad nauseum, but if any of us don't recognize that there's a public component uh, to this, a political component, then you know you you're fooling yourself. It's always there. And that is exactly why we did what we did to identify the landowners along the pipeline. Yeah. Um, because the, the system is set up to keep everything pretty quiet um, yeah. for the most part, not to connect people. And, you know, the, the, um, the for, uh, FERC and the pipeline company would not release those names to us. So we had to, we had to go get them. Um, yeah. But then we got um, public input. And in the end, the pipeline was built, but we got a better process out of it, I think. Right. Now, I have a question. Um, so, and I've had this uh, asked of me, of local governments. Uh, so what exactly uh, preempts local stormwater control over okay. these issues? Because, I mean, they're the ones who are severely impacted by right. the turbidity that inevitably happens. Yeah. So what specifically preempts them? Unfortunately, the Natural Gas Act essentially are, uh, makes it so that neither a state nor a federal agency can require a, an MPDS discharge permit for erosion, sediment, and stormwater. So Whereas both localities and the state agencies might in general apply those kinds of discharge limits for any other construction site, they cannot do it here. But the important, and there's another wrinkle to that is that Virginia has this program under which certain kinds of, of projects cut, cut localities out altogether but reserve some of that authority to the state, to the, to the DEQ. Now, the thing is that even if you're not, even if your state or your locality can't specifically require that kind of permit and approval, that's when you go back to the broad expanse of this 401. Whoever is looking at a 401 doesn't have to say, you got to go get a st construction stormwater uh, general permit or individual permit. What they say is, yeah, you're exempt from that process, but we can't make this determination of reasonable assurance that standards will be met unless we look at those factors. And there's nothing that prevents the state from incorporating those issues into the 401 process, nothing. And so, you know, the, the localities, like you say, they're going to bear the brunt of these things. They should be insisting that those values be involved and that they be allowed to be part of that process. Again, we, we have a funny, uh, an unfortunate statutory thing that 
that causes problems with that. But they have been big voices. As I told you, some of them are very concerned and, and know that their water supply uh, sources are going to be damaged. And so they've been important voices. And so that 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 has to be part of the overall assessment for the 401. All right, if anybody else has questions, be sure to go ahead and type them in. Um, otherwise, we're going to start wrapping up. Um, one thing that I will um, circle back on is if you listened in to episode one, so there's so much of this goes back to that pre-filing docket um, and monitoring and being aware and getting um, documenting things and getting them on the record um, before the certificate application even comes in. So even though people can't intervene at that point, that pre-file docket is so important. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, it, and it goes to the, the EA and the EIS as well as to what those specific local conditions are that need to be identified. Because a lot of times the agencies, they aren't down on the ground. They aren't at the local level. Yeah. Um, and they, you know, they, they don't know the idiosyncrasies of the area and, and, you know, specific impacts that, you know, well, I, I know from experience that my neighbor's land, when it rains, this happens, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So it's so crucial. Well, that, you're, you're absolutely right. The sooner you start getting in there and placing things in the record, uh, the better off you are. And, you know, I talked a lot about under NEPA how this kind of substantive thing, you know, my, my scientist stacked up against your scientist, you know, in general, if they're both credible, the citizen's probably not going to win. But you got to bring that stuff anyway, because sometimes they didn't bother to answer our scientists. In fact, at the federal court hearing uh, last month, one of the judges held up a report that we had submitted from a Ph.D. hydrologist and said, I don't see where you answered this. This woman, this this doctor so and so says it's going to be bad. And I don't see where you you explained otherwise. So never never hesitate to get all that in the in the record, and uh, you know you have a chance of getting getting judges to pay attention to it. All right, I have one more question here. Is there a link currently available for documents submitted under NEPA for public record? Now I'm going to assume that is within a particular pipelines. Um, docket and if so yes and um, that how to how to um, go through the FERC website to find those things out is was covered in episode one um, but yeah those everything that is filed in relationship to any particular pipeline project is filed with FERC um, right. And is on on the the docket page for that particular case. Um, most things are public. A few things are going to be considered private that people like you and me can't look at. Um, and some things are going to be considered critical energy infrastructure and also confidential and we can't look at. But anything that is a comment um, or a study or anything like that is is going to be part of that docket record. Um, so yes. All right, there are no other questions. Um, and the um, episode one is already up on our website on that um, registration page, that landing page that we have. And I'm going to be sending all that out to everybody, um, as well as the slide deck for episode one. And all of this is going to be available. And this uh, is, I think, all I have. I will, everybody can have. 15 minutes back in their day. Um, David, did you have anything you wanted to close with? Yeah, just I, I'll reiterate that don't be put off by the complexities. Don't think that you cannot be effective in these processes, even though there, there's a lot of details and a lot of things to learn. 
Um, you can play an important role. And there are lots of us out there who are prepared to try to help you. Uh, I think I think my contact information was included here somewhere. If not, uh, right Shelby, yeah. Um, I'm always willing to help people. Uh, I do contract work, but as Shelly knows, I'll, I'll pretty much talk to anybody on the phone if I can help you uh, uh, try to beat one of these things. So don't forget that. And don't forget that there's lots of other folks who have seen parts of this picture and can help you understand it. Yep. All right. Well, um, with that, I think we will close out. Let me make sure there are no. Oh, wait a minute. Let's see. Oh, OK. No more questions. Some very nice comments, however. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. Um, well, with that, I hope we'll see everybody for um, episode three, because you know you want to know everything about decatherms. You know you do. And, <laughs> and thanks, thanks everybody, for, for tuning in. And again, once we have all these things up, share. They're, they're here to be a resource. Um, thanks so much for everybody joining us. We'll see you next time.